Thank you for tuning into Stepping Stones of Faith. Stepping Stones of Faith is a ministry of Claytonville United Brethren Church. Our service times are as follows. Sunday morning Sunday school starts at 9.30 a.m. Sunday morning worship starts at 10.30 a.m. If you would like to join us for any of these services, our address is 106 Elizabeth Street, Claytonville, Illinois, 60926. We hope to see you this morning. We are going to be in Amos chapter 2. Amos chapter 2. There are nine chapters in this book. So for the next nine weeks or ten weeks, we will try to get this worked through. So starting with verse 1 of chapter 2. Thus says the Lord, for these three gener transgressions of Moab and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because he burned to, to lime the bones of the king of Edom. So I will send fire against Moab and it will devour the fortresses of Kerioth. Moab will die in uproar with a war cry and the alarm of the trumpet. I will, cry, I will cut off the ruler from, the, from its mist and will slay all its princes with him, says the Lord. Moab was a southern neighbor to Judah and was the last of the six judgments Amos proclaimed against the Gentile nations in this section. God promised judgment against Moab because of their cruelty to Edom and their king. We could say that Moab sinned against the past by, de de by desecrating the remains of an Edomite hero. Now, judgment, we know, came upon Edom in the book of, in the, in the book of Obadiah because of their uh, their transgressions against the, Isra the Israelites. Now, now um, Moab is being uh, passed judgment because of their transgressions against Edom. Now, the Edomite hero, um, the one... I'm, I couldn't find any information on that who that was, but we do know that uh, Edom is now being, uh, I wouldn't say avenged, but there's judgment against Moab for going against Edom. Now we could say, why would that be? Uh, why would that be? Because I would, I would venture a guess that because Edom or Esau, they're, they're descendants of Esau, there were, there were, he was also God's chosen pe person. If you remember when Esau was cast out, um, God still took care of him. God still ministered through him and to him. So, verses 4 and 5. Judgment against Judah. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments. The lies which their fathers followed have led them astray. So I will send fire against Judah and it will devour the fortresses of Jerusalem. So God is now casting judgment upon his chosen people because they did not follow the law. They rejected the law of the Lord and not kept his commandments. So we could say that God's judgment is for everyone who believes and doesn't believe. So everyone, if we call ourselves believers, yet we choose not to follow God, we are in judgment. We are incurring judgment upon ourselves just as 
he judges also other countries for their transgressions against Jerusalem and Judah, we too, being grafted in, can also be judged for our transgressions of not following the law and not keeping Christ's commandments. The lies which the fathers followed have led them astray. It reminds me of the New Testament where I believe it's Peter or Paul says not to be taken away with every wind of doctrine. We can be in that situation as well. Every wind of doctrine. We hear something, we see something, and we think, oh, that sounds good. Let's follow that. Where does it line up with Scripture? We, sometimes we don't even think to even look at that, but we say, well, that sounds good. Has a good sound to it. Once we get to that point, uh, we then become people with itching ears, seeking teachers to say the things we want to hear. It's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. God understands. What does the word say? These kinds of things was happening in Judah and they were incurring judgment because of it. That's interesting that today it still is a thing. You know why it's a thing? You know why it's a thing? Because we're human. That's why it's a thing. We're human. We have a heart. We have a mind. We have things we want to do. We don't want to give up control. So we think we can do what we want because we are believers. After all, it says in the scripture, what shall pull me from the love of God? Shall nakedness, shall all these, those things? So we can do all those things, right? Because it's in the word, we can do all those things. Those are, those are things that, that was taken out of context when we think of it that way. And therefore, when things are taken out of context, they are open up to being twisted and lies and, and we fall and follow those things. Looking at this verse, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away my punishment. It is remarkable to see the same judgment formula applied to, against Judah the people of God, as was applied against the previous six Gentile nations. It shows that Judah piled sin upon sin upon sin in the same manner as the other nations. You wonder why that is. Why did they pile sin upon sin upon sin? What was the reason for that? You think they maybe got a little bit uh, puffed up Maybe they got into some things, you know, back in the Old Testament times. They, were, they married into Gentile nations and pagan nations and they, they also adopted some of, the, some of the false gods. Was it some of that mentality? We find it easy and comfortable to expose and rebuke the sins of those who aren't the followers of God. Boy, isn't that interesting. When I think about that statement there that I wrote down, it's easier for us to point fingers at people that aren't God, godly people, that aren't followers of Christ. You know, when uh, I was younger, Pastor Steffi used to say, you point one finger at somebody, there's three pointing back at you. So it's easy for us to say, well, this guy is a non-believer because he does this or does that or goes here or goes there. But aren't we the same? What did Jesus say? Take the, take the plank out of your own eye before you try to take the speck out of, out of your brother's eye. Amos did, with that, that, that's what Amos did with the first pro pronouncements of judgment. 
But just as Amos went on to look at the sin among God's people, we should do the same. We should look at ourselves and realize that we are also sinful. When we get puffed up, when we get proud, pride is a sin, self is a sin, dying to, not dying to self is a sin. Self is the biggest thing we have to battle against in this Christian walk. Battling against self. And it's not new to us. They did the same thing here. Self is the thing we have to look at here. The second part, because they despised the law of the Lord, Judah's sin was that they despised and disobeyed the law of the Lord. You ever have anybody that says, well, I don't want to go to church because there's a lot of rules and regulations? There's a lot of don'ts and a lot of do's. Don't go here, don't go there, do this, do that. Churches are like that, some of them. But church, but the relationship with God is not so much that. It's the freedom that we receive. This was a higher accountability than God required of any of the six Gentile nations previously mentioned in Amos. God blessed his people with his law and commandments, but he expected them to honor and obey his word. Now, think about this for a moment. How many of you guys, when you were younger, had kids over your house or had, had your kids have kids over their house? Did you um, discipline your kids differently? So they're playing outside and somebody, or somebody gets hurt or somebody says something. You, did you discipline your kids harsher than the other kids? We do that. You know why? Because I'm not those other kids' dad. I'm my kid's dad. And if they are doing something they shouldn't do as a group, my kids, they all get a talking to, but my kids get more talking to when the kids are gone. Because they understand the rules. And see, that's what's happening here with these people. They understand the rules. They know what's expected of them. God held them to a higher accountability because they know what is right and what is true. The Gentile nations didn't necessarily know fully what Judah and Israel knows. We are to honor his word. We are, some people say, some people teach that the church today, the New Testament church, is a replacement for Israel. That we are now the chosen people, Israel is not. I will never teach that. That is not true. That is replacement theology, and that is not of God. Israel is God's chosen people. We are God's chosen people also, but we are grafted in. We're grafted in. We're not replacing Israel. We're in addition to Israel. We're grafted in. And so... Now, as God's people, we know the truth. We know what God expects. So we are going to be held to a higher accountability to our Heavenly Father than those that don't know God. Why? Because we should be telling them. We should be talking to others. We should be ministering to others. And we're not some of us, sometimes, are we? For whatever reason, not comfortable with it, don't find the time, can't find the time, don't want to find the time, whatever the reason, we know the rules. What did he say? You will be my witnesses, right? So we are to do that which God calls us to do. Sometimes we don't. Because we, for whatever reason, and you know those reasons and I know those reasons, we don't have to name them. But we don't always. 
And we know the truth. We know what we're supposed to be doing. And if we choose not to do it, we are incurred, we're incurring judgment upon ourselves. The second part, or the third part, the lies lead them astray. Since the Word of God brings us truth, when we despise and dis disobey God's Word, we naturally embrace and follow lies. You can't reject the truth without grabbing a hold of a lie. You can't. Think about it. Somebody were to tell you, the sun doesn't rise on, on, in the east, it rises in the south. That's a lie, right? But if you choose not to believe that it rises in the east, that it rises in the south, you're rejecting the truth, even though the truth is right there every morning, you're rejecting that truth and you're grabbing onto a lie. That's like saying, you know, Jim, your hair is not gray. It's black. Jim, like, yeah, my hair is black. I'm young now. Look at me. Woo. 40 years younger. <clears throat> you know what I mean? That's a lie, right? <clears throat> but you're, we're grasping onto something that we know is not true, thereby following a lie. Just like when someone says, you can't walk away from God's grace. You can't walk away from his salvation. You can do whatever you want. You can live your life however you want. You're saved, you got saved 20 years ago, that's fine. Go live your life. Go walk in darkness. You're saved 20 years ago. What does it matter now? A lot of people preach that. And that's not true. We choose to follow a lie because it makes us feel better. We don't like the restrictions that go with the truth. Follow his commandments. That's the truth. What does that require? It requires we do certain things when we read the Bible. We pray every day. We read every day. We, we do what God wants us to do through his word. We don't like to do that sometimes. So we say, well, God understands why I don't want to, and therefore I'm not going to. That is a lie, and it's going to lead us into a position of never wanting to follow God. I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the place, the, the palaces of Jerusalem. Because Judah sinned, like the other nations, they would be judged as the other nations, with fire against them and their palaces. Amos chapter 1, verse 4, 1, 7, 1, 10, 1, 12, 1, 14, and 2, 2. You see, we are no different when we walk away, when we walk in darkness. We're no different than those that don't know the Lord. We're no different. We think we are. I became a Christian 20 years ago. I can do what I want. We are no different than those that don't. Why do you think no one comes to church? Why do you think churches in general, not just this one, churches in general are losing attendance? Because the Christian chooses, on some, some levels, chooses to follow a lie. You don't have to come to church. Let's do it online. There's no need for that anymore. There's no need for that anymore. We need to be doing it in person. You don't need to go to church. You can worship at home. That's not biblical. You shall not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. But that's a lie. Because we're to, we're to assemble together. Why do we assemble together? Encouragement, support, God's blessing on the community of the believers and the individuals of the believers. As we are blessed individually, we come together communally, communally, then we are glorifying God together. And God is blessing us together. 
When we sin, we're no better than anybody else. We're no better than the person who we're ministering to if we sin just like them. The repeated use of fire to express judgment is continued in the New Testament. Without doubt, Amos meant material fire coming against material walls and palaces. But the Bible also uses fire in a spiritual way to describe the purifying work of God in the believer. The Bible says that God will test the works of each believer with fire to burn away what is unworthy. 1 Corinthians 3, 13-15. Tested like fire. We, there's, there's analogies in the New Testament of how they purify silver and gold by fire. And we are then tested that way. And the things that come off because of that make us more pure before God. That's what's happening in this judgment in Amos. The things that are being brought down and purified with fire physically will bring up something that is more, more of a blessing to the, to the people of God. The Bible says believers will be tested. So if you're a believer, you're going to be tested with fire. If you call yourself a Christian and you think, well, it's easy street now. Going to heaven, it's not going to be easy. If a pastor tells you you get saved, everything's going to be hunky-dory and everything's great, Run from that person because it is not great. It is not easy. It is a difficult thing. And we must understand that to stay in God, we have to be tested. To grow in God, we have to be tested and formed and tried and true before God. That's what it's about. It's easy street. You don't have to do anything. You just give your heart to the Lord and all you got to do is just do that and you can do whatever you want. Nope. That is not the gospel. We are to understand that we are to be, as, as we grow, we are tested. As we grow, we are tried. Why? To be more like Christ. Did you know when you go down to a, you find a, a spring of water that comes up anywhere. It doesn't just burst up. It's not just easy, just boom. It has had to work for years to get the pressure, not that it's a physical, not, not that it's an animate object or whatever, it's inanimate, but that water has had to be pushed through rock and pushed through sand and soil to get to the top. Tried and tested to get to the top. We are like that. It's not easy street. We're tried and we're tested each and every day. When we think of God's purifying fire, we should think, the way Peter expressed it in 1 Peter 4.17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Isn't that interesting? We should invite God to burn down whatever walls or palaces we build against him so that the work can continue in us and through us without hindrance. So what are, we, what are, what are palaces have we built in our lives? What walls have we built up around our heart that keeps God out? What are some of those things? And have we asked God to break those things down so that he can work through us without hindrance? Verse 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel 
and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. They trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and push the oppressed out of the way. A man and his father go into the same, go in to the same woman profaning my holy name. They recline by every altar on garments taken in pledge and in their house of their gods. They drink the wine from those who have been fined. Now, Israel, Israel is doing this. God's chosen people. The Bible says that the elect will be deceived. The very elect will be deceived. That's Israel in this text. They're deceived. The pattern continued. The northern tribes of Israel had piled up sin upon sin upon sin, just as previous seven nations. They have sinned again and again and again and again. And it's important to note that this sin that is piled up, the reason judgment came to them in the first place was because of the sin that piled up and the unrepentant sin that continued. That is why unrepentant sin that has continued over and over and over again. And we see that today. We've said this many times in these studies. Sin upon sin upon sin on the believer piled up over years, decades, unrepentant, at some point will become judgment. Because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. Amos saw the injustice of rich against the poor and how the rich took cruel advantage against the poor. More importantly, God saw this injustice and promised judgment. We even saw this not only in Amos' day, but we see this and we read about it in the New Testament. The Gentiles, the poor folk, were looked upon. They were taken advantage of. It was the Sadducees and the Pharisees who prospered and the religious leaders who prospered, but not God's people. But we're talking about Israel here, taking on the same, and same mentality as a Gentile nation. A Gentile nation that didn't know God. And they take on the same mentality. Because why? Because it's more profitable. It's more easier for them to disenfranchise those who are poor. A man and his father going to the same woman. Amos saw the sexual immorality and perversion of his day and how standards were once accepted were then disregarded. So the law was disregarded. If you look in the, in the Old Testament books of Leviticus, Numbers, and Exodus, the law, it gives... Pre, um, well, how do I want to say, different expectations about a, fa about a man and his wife and his children and what's expected morally and even sexually. And that is disregarded in Amos' day. Some might say, well, how did that happen? Why did that happen? It's the heart of man. The heart of man is black and dark and forever sinful. And God is saying judgment will come upon those 
who do not repent for their darkness and their sinful natures. This probably speaks of a father and son using the same ritual idolatrous prostitute, which also is a violation of the law. They were licentious to the utmost abomination, for, their, for in their idol feasts were young women prostituting themselves publicly in honor of Astarte, the father and, uh, the, the father and son entered into impure connections with the same female. So they were also taking part in honoring a false god. What's easy? What's nice? What's, what's the rest of the crowd going to do? Following this crowd, following that crowd. Let's disregard our relationship with God. Let's disregard our relationship with Jesus and let's follow the crowd. What's the in crowd doing in this day? They were doing that. And Israel fell unrepentantly into that sin. And God said, enough's enough. We need to realize that today, in today's day and age, God is about ready to say, enough is enough. With individuals in this nation, in this world, and nations and this world as a whole, God is about ready to say enough is enough. Judgment is coming. Judgment has been here. But judgment is coming. More than we could ever imagine. God is about ready to say enough is enough. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge. Amos saw the idolatry of his day and how people worshipped idols even as they, cruelty, as they cruelly oppressed the poor. Exodus 22, 26 or 27. Commanded, if you ever take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. So they weren't doing that. They were disregarding that law in Exodus. So that there was sinful. For that is the only covering, for that is the only covering, it is, the, it is his garment for his skin. What will he sleep in? And it will be that when he cries to me, I will hear for I am gracious. The prophecy of Amos showed that God heard the cry of the oppressed in Israel and would bring judgment against Israel. So judgment against Israel was to protect those that were crying out to God in Israel. They were not following the law. And God said enough is enough. In combination, the whole picture is almost overwhelming. Amos pictured a man committing sexual immorality with a temple prostitute, the same girl his son visited the day before, and keeping warm with the garment extorted from the poor, toasting his successes with wine bought with money dishonestly gained. Ooh, boy. Sounds like society in 2023. And do we think that we're immune in 2023 of the judgment of God? Guess what? We're not. God will judge. Believe me. He will judge. What is the call for us as believers? What is the call for us as people? To repent and get right with God. That is the call. Repent and get right with God. 
verse 9 to verse 12. Yet it was who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the, of the cedars. He was strong as the oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots below. It was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. I raised up some of your sons and prophets and some of your young men to, to, as Nazarites. It is, not, it is, is it not so, O children of Israel, says the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets, saying, Do not prophesy. So, he's doing some things here. Wasn't it I that brought you up out of the land of Egypt? Have you forgotten your past? Didn't I lead you for 40 years in the desert? Didn't I give you the land of the Amorites? Didn't I do all these things? And we just cast that aside. Today's day and age, we're believers. Didn't I bring you out of that sin? Didn't I bring you out of that debauchery? Didn't I bring you out of that addiction? And yet you're walking back into it. That's essentially what he's saying here. God reminded Israel of his past power and faithfulness to them. When they first came into the promised land, they were afraid of the mighty nations like the Amorites, yet God conquered them. How could they reject and despise God who has done so much for them? It's a good question. It's a good question for 2023. How can God's people in 2023 reject God today there there is there is there's plenty of leeway for those that don't know God yet and those who have not heard of God because no one's talked to them or those who are not ready to accept God there's enough leeway for that although they are judged as well but there's no leeway for us we have gone through the trials the tests the victories with Jesus, and yet we turn our backs. Jesus says, go here. I don't want to go there. It's not comfortable. I don't want to do that. It's not my thing. I want you to, to, to do this. I don't want to do that. I'm not this type of person. So we turn away, and we don't follow God. We don't follow God. Jesus. Those who don't know Jesus yet, there's a little bit of leeway there. But once you know, once you understand, there is no excuse. God will remind you and if you still don't follow him, judgment is on the horizon. This principle, a walk with God based in gratitude for what he has done for us is important for the Christian who shows why the believer must continually hear the message of the cross. We must live our lives in proper gratitude for what the Lord has done for us. We must. That is why it is so important to go to church. That's why it's so important to come and worship together as believers. That's why it's important because it's important to hear the message of the cross. It's important to hear what Christ has done for us. It is important to have a healthy dose of gratitude for what Christ has done. Part two of that. I raised up some of your sons and pro as prophets. God reminded Israel of the great privilege they had in working together with God. You remember that? Are you doing that? Are you working together with God? Gratitude for this great honor should have kept them humble and obedient before the Lord. But they rejected and despised him, commanded, commanding the prophets to say, by saying, do not prophesy. 
Why do you think that is? You ever, you ever have anybody that said that was a Christian? The Bible says we are to restore a brother with meekness. You ever have anybody that you're trying to minister to and they say, I don't want to talk to you about the Lord? And they were once a Lord, a, a believer at one time. Do you know why they said do not prophesy? Because they knew what it was going to be. Turn back to God. Turn back. Judgment is coming. They don't want to hear that. Believers don't want to hear that. Turn back when they're walking away. They don't want to hear that for whatever reason. I don't want to hear that. And some of your young men as Nazarites, the vow of a Nazarite was a special vow, a dedication unto the Lord. And God gave a, the gift of this deeper opportunity to Israel. Instead of receiving this honor with gratitude and humility, they rejected and despised the Lord. You gave the Nazarites wine to drink. What was a Nazarite vow? They were not to drink wine, remember? They weren't to cut their hair and they weren't to drink wine. And they gave them wine to drink. Now, let's look at that for a moment. They gave them wine to drink, but the Nazarite, who, was a, who took the Nazarite vow, also understood what the vow was. So they, too, were in sin. They didn't blindly say, oh, I can drink this now, okay. They understood what the Nazarite vow was. And they, too, were sinning. But... Both parties are in judgment. One for lying and the other for obeying the lie. The vow of a Nazarite is described in number six and was used to express a special desire to draw close to God and to separate from the comforts and pleasures of the world. Under the Nazarite vow, a man would eat or, eat, would eat or drink nothing from the grapevine, would not cut his hair, and would not go near a dead carcass. So, look at Samson. What did Samson do? He beat people with a jawbone of an ox, I believe it was. Huh? Donkey. So he was disobeying his Nazarite vow. So, they understood this, but yet they drank wine. So, where, where, does, it, what is, where does it go between, where, what happens when we, where, does it, where do you draw the line between, um, I understand what I'm supposed to do, and there's like, they, there's like this gray area, right? where we can do this as long as it, there's like in your mind, in our minds, there's like a gray area, you know. But there's no gray area. Samson did black, was supposed to be white. You know, the black and white. The black and white of the, of the Nazarite vow. No handling a dead carcass. No going near a dead carcass. So he did the bad thing. These people drank wine. There was no exceptions for that. They were not supposed to eat anything from the grapevine or drink anything from the grapevine, and they did anyway. It doesn't matter what these people say. What does God's word say? That can be brought into today's way of thinking. Today's TV preachers and prophets and evangelists who like to line their pockets with people's money. What does it say in the Word of God based on what they're saying? That's why it's so important to be like a Berean. Study to see that those things were true. That's what they did with Paul or Peter, one of them. Started with a P, Paul or Peter. He inclined them to study to show that he was doing what he was supposed to do. Study to see that these things were so. We don't seem to do that anymore. And they obviously didn't do it. 
judgment came. We don't do it anymore because we want what is comfortable. We want what is easy. We want what is natural to our sin nature. That's what we want. We don't want the hard stuff. We want what's natural to our sin nature. 13 through 16. We're good. We got like another 20, 30 minutes. Jesus, or indeed, indeed, I will slow, your, slow you down as a wagon is slowed that is full of sheaves. Flight will perish from the, from the swift. The strong will not remain his strength, will not retain his strength, nor will the warrior save his life. The bowman will not stand firm. The swift-footed will not escape, nor will the horseman save his life. He that is courageous among the warriors will flee away naked on, the day, on that day, says the Lord. Now, he will not, the warrior will not save his life. We can now also pair that with Samson. Samson died, right? Because he disregarded the Nazarite vow, disregarding God's law. He came back to God, but he still paid the price. I am weighed down by you. God regarded the people of Israel as a weary burden, not as a joy. It is the difference between the pleasure as a, a parent feels in dealing with the obedient child and the drudgery a parent feels dealing with a stubborn, rebellious child. Can a, can a child in the back say amen? Right? God wants us, wants the pleasure of us, not the arduous task of training us up when we are fighting him at every step. Anytime justice is perverted, anytime the rich receive per peripheral treatment or the poor are oppressed, it burdens God who sees from heaven and he promised, promises to set it right. We see that also in the Old Testament. God delivers his people. Anytime people cheat and manipulate and make money off of others, in questionable ways, even if it is legal, it burdens God who sees from heaven and he promises to set it right. Anytime people unfairly profit at the expense of the unfortunate, it burdens God who sees from heaven and he promises to set it right. So God sees the things that we do that are not right and he will set it right. Amen? He will set it right. Now it is to be understood, dear friends, before we proceed farther, that our text is but a figure since God is not to be oppressed by man. All the sin that man can commit can never disturb the serenity of his perfections, nor cause so, so much as a, as a wave upon the sea of his everlasting calm. He doth but speak to us after the manner of man. So the Lord says that under the load of human guilt, he is pressed down until he crieth out, because he can bear no longer the iniquity of those who offered against him. Charles Spurgeon said that. God sees those who are oppressed. God ministers to those who are oppressed. God will deliver those who are oppressed. Flight shall perish from the swift. The strong shall not strengthen his power. 
one way the judgment of God would express itself against Israel was that they would find themselves unable to succeed in ways they previously thought they were strong without the blessing of God. How many times have we done that? Don't worry, God, I've got it handled. I can handle it, God. Don't worry about it. I'm going to do this. God says, don't do that. I'm going to do it anyway because I believe I can do it. What happens when that happens? It's always a mess. It's always a mess. Things go wrong. Things always go wrong. We don't follow God. Trust me. The swift isn't fast enough. The strong isn't strong enough. The mighty isn't mighty enough to succeed. Israel was far too confident in their own ability, but God would bring them low. How many times do we get so confident in what we can do? What we can say, where we can go, what we can do in our own abilities. How, how often do we get so confident? God says he will bring us low when we're confident in things that are not of him. Why were they confident? Why were they strong? Why were they swift? Why were they mighty? Why would God take that away from them? Because they did it on their own strength. They did it on their own strength. We can escape this judgment by realizing now that even our strength is nothing without the Lord. Paul com communicated this idea in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We can become more vulnerable in our perceived strengths than in our acknowledged weaknesses. Let me read that again so you understand it. We can become more vulnerable in our perceived strengths than our, in our acknowledged weaknesses. Interesting. What's that saying? Our pride is our downfall. If we are just honest with ourselves and honest with those around us, we then understand that we need Jesus. We need God. And that is admitting weakness. That is admitting vulnerability. That is doing away with pride. Amen? So what is our lesson from chapter 2 of Amos? Let's not be prideful. Let's not be puffed up. Let's not be unrepentant. But let's go before God in repentance. Let's go before God in our weaknesses that he can make us strong. Not strength that we have ourselves, but strength he can give. Strength that he ministers to us. Amen? Amen? So that is our assignment. Go before the Lord this week and ask him how to make us strong. Help us not to be weak, but help us to be strong. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for this word. May it find root in our heart. And Lord, may you give us the strength to do the things in which you've called us to do. And may we not turn away from those things, but may we embrace the call upon our lives and the things you'd want us to do. Help us to follow your commands. Help us to minister to others as you would call us to do. And Lord, we thank you for that. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to Stepping Stones of Faith. I pray that you find value in this content. You can also find an audio podcast of this program on all the major podcasting platforms. Just type Stepping Stones of Faith into the podcast search bar. Once again, I'm Pastor Josh. Thank you for joining me today. 